speaker, Adam Jacques, co-founder of Growers Guild Gardens in Sproutley. As co-founder of Growers Guild Gardens in Sproutley, Adam is a grower and breeder located in Eugene, Oregon. He's most widely known for his work with CBD breeding and its applications in a medical setting. Adam has been involved in cannabis for over 20 years. He was selected as one of the most influential in the industry by Cannabisness in 2016. He's a lead writer for Grow Magazine. While his focus is on breeding cannabis strains with extremely unique properties, he also has a 40-acre cannabis farm, retail locations, and many other projects in the works. Without further ado, uh, Adam, go ahead and begin. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Jacques. Like you said, I'm from Eugene, Oregon. We got a pretty good idea of who I am there. Today, I'm going to be talking about methods and technologies essential to breeding cannabis. Um, just giving you an overview of how to create a cannabis strain, what that looks like, and what kind of methodologies we use to achieve our results. So, Adam and his work, we've gotten that basic breeding overview and what will be covered. Um, so, really what I want to go into is just kind of the basics of how we develop a strain, what that looks like, why we would want to develop new strains when so many already exist, um, and then take a look at how to lock those strains down or make those strains regular so you don't have issues in your garden. So we'll start with why should I breed cannabis? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you should breed cannabis. Um, one, if you have your own cannabis company or you want something unique for your own branding, having your own unique line of cannabis for your store or for your grow is a really great way to get your name out there and a really great way to showcase what it is that you do and how you do it. Um, so something like let's, you know, another industry like microbrewery or wineries, um, they obviously have their own unique brand and don't all sell the same thing. So when you're, if you just have blueberry, let's say at your grow facility, well, you know, there's a ton of other grow facilities that are growing that exact same thing. If you have a unique strain to you and your grow, um, it's, it's a great marketing tool and it showcases your ability to have unique and innovative products on the market. Um, your first step in breeding cannabis um, is accessing genetics. And so to get your hands on genetics, you would want to speak to a breeder or a seed bank or a clone shop or anywhere you feel like um, the genetics that you want to work with are accessible. In a lot of states right now and countries, um, accessing legal genetics is a little bit difficult. There are gray market sellers of genetics, but I cannot say go and use them. I don't want anybody to get in trouble. But you can reach out to me or any other breeders via Facebook or email and ask them, hey, how would I go about getting this in a legal way? Um, when using somebody else's genetics to create your own genetics, it's kind of it's common practice to ask for permission from the breeder that you're breeding with. If you're creating genetics for your own home use or your own home garden or to hand out to friends and you expect to get no financial benefit from it, it's kind of an unnecessary step. But if you're planning on using this strain for sales or to sell the seed or to create your own strain to sell at your stores, one, it's always just nice to ask permission. Two, if you ask permission from the breeder, they can give you ideas on how that strain grows. They can verify the genetics for you, and they can help you legitimize your strain. So basics for starting. So when we're going to start this breeding process, what we want to do is make sure that we have male and female plants. So what that's going to do, we're going to have to sex our plants from seed or clone. The so first step here, what we're looking at on the left is a male plant, on the right is a female plant. When we are sexing our plants, the easiest way to do it would be through a forced flowering. That means we would put our plants into the dark for 48 hours, return the lights to the plants, leave the lights running for about a week. And when you look at the crotches or the internodes of these plants, you will see one of two distinctly different looking 
org and let's say on the left little what we call balls in the industry and that's kind of what they look like two little things with no hairs coming out of it on the right white wispy hairs will start to come out of the female plant um, cannabis is a plant that has both sex male and female so you need one of each to be able to create genetics so once you have your male and your female plant how do we pollinate those plants? How do we choose which female goes with which male? So to be able to pollinate your plant, you have to have a male. That male will open up a flower, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner there. And on that fan leaf to the left, you see that powder. That is the male pollen. You can segregate your males from your females, collect the pollen, save it in an airtight jar, and that's a good way to apply it with what we call hand painting. So you can take that jar of pollen, use a tester paintbrush like you would use for modeling or something like that. Um, take a little bit of that pollen and apply it directly to the female flower. This allows you to not use too much pollen in your space. Um, pollen goes a long way. Pollen granules are extremely small. Um, a lot of people also do what we call open pollination. Open pollination would be selection of a male, putting the male into your room allowing it to naturally pollinate, keep a fan running to move the pollen around, and that would pollinate all of the females in the space, and if you're not careful, all of the females in the neighborhood. Here's some tools that we use while we're pollinating. Um, open pollination, obviously you don't need these tools. I don't necessarily recommend open pollination because it is going to cause problems. Um, you're going to get pollen everywhere. So the idea of segregating your males, collecting pollen into an airtight vessel, using paint brushes to apply is the safest way to pollinate without accidentally pollinating yourself or things around you. Um, using a spray bottle with RO water after you pollinate your room or even a larger sprayer after you pollinate your plants with the hand brushing method, the uh, female will take the pollen and pretty much instantly become pregnant with seeds. So at that point, spray down your entire room and your plants, everything with RO water. That will neutralize the existing pollen in the room and will save you from dragging pollen into your outdoor gardens or into another room. Also, I always kind of recommend when we're talking about the kind of gear to use for pollination, um, coveralls, uh, face covers, shoe covers, things like that are great, something that you can keep sanitary. Also, showering before and after you enter your seating room so as not to bring in rogue pollen and not to bring pollen out of your space. Here, a nice drawing by my friend Ed Rosenthal, and what we're looking at here is just kind of a closer up of uh, what the flowers look like. Um, on the top, we have the males. You see the opening flowers. Um, on the far right top, you see what is a mature male flower open. Um, when that happens, they have released all of their pollen. On the bottom, we have our females. The one on the bottom left will give you a good idea of what the initial sexing should look like. When you get to the point where we're at on the right, where we see what we call cotton balls, with a lot of hairs coming out, this is a very good time to pollinate your plants. Um, seed at this point will give you plenty of time to get nice ripe seeds by the time you're ready for harvest. <clears throat> so once you've selected your male and female that you want to use for your breeding process, um, we're going to start taking a look at breeding for specific traits, kind of breeding for what it is you're looking for. So as an individual, if you're breeding for cannabinoids specifically or specific terpenes, specific grow patterns, specific, you know, highs, specific medical benefits, um, those are things you're going to really kind of have to know before you go into breeding. Otherwise, you're just going to be breeding random plants. So a very important part of this is keeping track of your genetics. Um, with genetic tracking, um, you can use the simple method with a journal and plant tags and a Sharpie. 
I use the multicolored plant tags a lot in my room. That way I can differentiate between males, females, strain specifics, growth patterns by sight by looking and seeing a plant tag of a certain color. Um, when you're breeding like this, make sure when you're tracking your plants, you do everything numerically um, so you know what version of the plant that is. If you're just going by strain name, there can be differences. Even if you go out and let's say you buy a pack of blue dream seeds and you go ahead and pop those seeds, well, you, it's going to be hard to know to what point the genus has brought those seeds to. So you may be working with F1 stock. So when you pop something, don't just write Blue Dream on the tag. Let's say you pop 10 seeds of Blue Dream. Write Blue Dream 1, Blue Dream 2. Make sure you know what the differences between those are. Also, technology has come along, and something I utilize in my room is QR tag assistance. That is printing out small QR tags, attaching them to the outside of my pots. I can scan that QR tag using my phone, and it brings up a journal on my phone, which I have uploaded to the cloud and on my computer, that gives me tracking of that strain. And so I have it all digitally, all saved, and I can save photos of that strain. Generally, I go ahead and I take a photo of the strain every two days, three days, so I keep track of the strain constantly in a digital format throughout its entire grow. So there are two different ways to breed. When we started breeding long, long ago for kind of this recreational medical market, we didn't really have access to laboratories um, that were testing cannabis for cannabinoids or terpenes or the like. So we did what we would call unassisted breeding techniques. Unassisted breeding techniques are using sight, smell, and effect to give you an idea of what kind of cannabis you're working with. Um, Sight, obviously, what you're looking at is what is the bag appeal of this strain? Is this a pretty strain? Does it look like hay? You know, is this something that's going to sell? Um, also, what you're looking at with your sight is bloom times. How long is it taking this plant to flower? When is the plant finishing? Obviously, when breeding for a recreational or financially viable business, um, you want to have strains that are going to finish in a certain amount of time. Um, all of us like a nice, what do we call, end game sativa, but financially it doesn't really make much sense to grow a strain that goes 16 weeks when your standard strains go six to eight weeks. So you want to make sure to keep a good eye on your bloom times. Um, your terpenes and flavonoids. Um, laboratories, of course, are great to help you with that, but you can obviously do that yourself. That is going to be the smell and the flavor of the flower. Um, so find those terpenes and those flavonoids that you like in those flowers, the ones that you want to accentuate and bring out, maybe the ones that you want to mix. Um, and one last step in assisted breeding is how does it make you feel? So as a breeder, one of the terrible parts of the job is we pretty much have to sample everything that comes through our line. So when you're breeding and when you're looking for a female or a male to use, as we're doing in this point, Try all the samples. Find the varieties that you like and are giving you the effects that you want. Then we go into lab-assisted breeding. Lab-assisted breeding made all of our lives so much easier. Lab-assisted breeding allows us to do ratio tests for cannabinoids, which means when I'm trying to develop a strain that is high in CBD, low in THC, or a 1 to 1 or a 3 to 1, Instead of growing that plant out, waiting for a flowering test, and then going back to the drawing board, I can pop 100, 200, 500 seeds, take leaf samples, take them into the lab, and get an idea of what my cannabinoid ratios are. Cannabinoid ratios meaning how many parts CBD do I have to THC. So that gives me a head start where I don't have to flower out the, the, the plant completely. I can just take a look at what ratios it is I'm working with, save those ratios, and it gives me a head start on knowing where my CBD dominance is. Also, at the end of flowering, it is nice to be able to go out and get cannabinoid and terpene testing done on your plants. That will give you a percentage of what my cannabinoids are in this plant, what percentage terpenes exist in this plant. And when breeding for a specific cannabinoid or a specific terpene, you can take those ones that are showing large spikes in the areas that you want, save those plants to the side for more aggressive breeding and cull out the ones that you don't want. Um, 
So you have found your male, you have found your female, you have bred them together, and now you're growing your own custom genetics. So tracking your custom grow, watching for issues, sample sizes, and how to pick your keepers. What to look for in your, can your plants, showing the characteristics you desire. So just like growing out somebody else's male and female for your home breeding project, you want to take a look at the new genetics that you grew. What are they showing from that mother and father? What kind of unique things are you seeing in those plants? What kind of, are you seeing what you wanted? Let's say you wanted to pull in these three unique terpenes and this cannabinoid. Are you seeing those at the end? Are you seeing the growth rates you want? Are you seeing the, the time of bloom that you want? Are they not problem plants? Problem plants come into play a lot when we're breeding with what we call polyhybrids. Polyhybrids are, for a simple term, when a lot of strains get bred together a lot of times, um, you will start seeing issues with plants. Um, some will attract mold. Some will attract bugs. Some will do what we see here, and this is called what we uh, herm or hermaphrodite. So a plant will start growing. It'll show female flowers early in flower. You will say, great, that is a female plant. Let's see where it goes. And if you're not watching, you're not paying attention, it will grow male flowers on that plant. Male flowers on that plant will pollinate that plant in your entire room with pollen, and problem plants will continue to exist in your space. When you're growing out your seeds from the breeding project that you've done, Sample size is very important. If you only grow out a few of those plants, you're only seeing a few expressions available of the mother and father that you've put together. Um, for me, I would say at least 100 seeds of your variety. That'll give you a pretty good idea of exactly what you have and allow you to pick a male and a female out of your breeding project that are showing all of the things that you want your strain to show. Um, this picture behind here is one of my um, study rooms where I'm going through a bunch of different genetics. In that room, I have about 500 plants. It goes away to the right in that picture. Um, I feel comfortable with that range. If you don't have the space to do that in your own location, a method a lot of breeders will use is what they call trial packs or tester packs. So give the seeds to friends or other growers and have them grow out 20 each or something like that and give the seeds to them for free. And all you ask in return is please save cuts of these plants for me so I can have them back if they're ones that I want, and journal your grow so I know what kind of plants we're working with. Um, one thing that we do in breeding that isn't really normally done in any other style of cannabis growing is we'll flower our females, but we also flower our males too. You can flower your males in a environment with filters and airlock so the pollen doesn't go everywhere. But you want to see how your male grows. The growth structure of the male in a lot of ways will look like the growth structure of a female where the male flowers are stacking up. You can also smell terpenes on that plant and they'll give you a good idea of what kind of males you're working with. Knowing what the father is is just as important as knowing what the mother is. So, now we've gotten to this point, you've started growing out your own seeds, you've been tracking your grow all along, and out of these hundreds of females and males you've started, you found your all-stars or your rock stars, the plants that are exactly what you were looking for and the ones that you want to cultivate for yourself or for others. Um, <laughs> at this point, we need to lock down this genetic. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways to do that. The standard way and the way that I like, the way we see the most hybrid vigor, the way we see the healthiest seeds and the way that it's been done for a long time is what we're going to call cubing. Cubing your genetics is taking the original female that you like, make sure we save a lot of clones of that female. So we're going to take one of those female clones and we're going to pick a male from the same breeding batch. So a brother's, to, a brother's seed to that female. Pick out the male you think is the best, the male you like the most that's showing what you want to see. You take that male and you interbreed it to that female. So you breed those two together. Then you're going to get a whole new bunch of seeds off of that female plant. 
So go through those seeds. Once again, pick a male out of those seeds after you pop them and you grow them out that you like the look of, you like the way it's going. Take that male and cross it back to that original clone mother again. Do that again and again. So we do that four times and we've done what's called cubing a genetic. Cubing a genetic gives us about 90% real reliability that the seeds coming out of that cube genetic or filial generation four, a lot of times you'll see seeds as F1, F2, F3, F4. Those are meaning what filial generation those seeds are in. By the time we get to an F4, we've got those genetics pretty well locked down. Um, at that point, you have seeds. You have seeds that I would consider saleable, and you could be confident in telling somebody these are the genetics that you're going to get out of these seeds. Another way people um, breed genetics is through selfing or S1s. So a lot of times you'll see seeds called S1s or S2s, and these are self-genetics. How do you get a self-genetic? Well, you take a female, cut clones off of that female, put some clones aside, take one clone, begin to flower it. As that clone is flowering, when it starts to come to maturity, you're going to want to stress that plant. There are different methods to stressing a plant. You can use colloidal silver, or you can use a hormone spray that you can buy at the grow store, or you can use a light leak. But what we're trying to do is stress that plant into creating male flowers. Um, once that female creates male flowers and herms, collect that pollen off of that plant. Then take one of the other clones from that exact same strain, grow that up, and when that strain starts to mature, take that pollen from your hermed plant and apply it to the female plant. When you do that, you're creating an S1 seed. Those seeds should be feminized and should be exact copies of that original plant. Sometimes um, due to conditions in the room, overstressing the plant, things of that nature, you may find that you've created a bunch of herms or something like that. So make sure and test your S1s that you've, that you've done the proper uh, the proper methodologies with it so you don't end up with a strain that is going to become a problem for you and other people. Um, but always, as always, I recommend keeping your strains regular, male and females, and cubing until the F4. So I guess that's kind of where I'm going to stop on the basics of breeding. Thank you for your time. Um, and I would be more than happy to take any questions, talk about any sort of specific cannabinoid or terpene breeding, and yeah, thank you very much.